grandparents <coughs> came to America, arriving in New Orleans in 1848. They came up the Mississippi River to St. Louis. They bought an acreage in Jefferson County near St. Louis, where several other families from Germany had settled. In 1857, they moved to Benton County, Missouri, where for $20 they purchased 40 acres and then added 200 acres of public land. In 1859, they added 40 more acres for $50, a total of 280 acres. My great-grandfather worked on a farm in Germany and, of course, tended horses. And all these years, even today, members of the Roderman family still work on horses. In 1902, my grandfather purchased a three-year-old black Pertran stallion named Veteran from a man uh, from Chicago. And the price of the horse was $2,000 who had been imported from France one month earlier. The reason the <coughs> season fee was $12. My nephew has the ledger showing record of mares bred to veteran, though I had never heard of, them, of this horse before. I guess this was the beginning of the horse history for Rotermans. Through the years, Rotermans showed horses at Missouri State Fair at Sedalia, Missouri, in Des Moines, Iowa, in American Royal in Kansas City, and at the Ozark Empire Fair in Springfield. I have ribbons from these shows. The earliest ribbon from Missouri State Fair was 1910, and the last was in 1941, with many years in between. They showed horses at American Royal in 1922, and again in 1939. Also showed in Springfield in 1939, and at Iowa State Fair in 1939, as well as at the Missouri State Fair. Now this I have no record of, but Dan remembers his dad telling him that they transported by rail, of course, some of their horses to the state fair in St. Paul, Minnesota. And they had their horses in tents, not in a building. And a terrific wind and rainstorm came up and blew the tent, part of the tent apart. And the horses panicked. And one of the, the stallion, was in a corner stall and got deathly sick. Called the vet. Wasn't anything they could do. So they loaded up the stallion and Reinhardt, my brother, came home on the train. So there were, were no winnings at the state fair, at the fair in St. Paul. So, so far as we know, I have no ribbons or no record. But anyway, it was the excitement of that terrific storm that sort of ruined their plans. We have two large shoe boxes or ribbons, but they are of silk or other fragile material, so that they are in, some of them are in pieces. My father, Uncle Henry, and several young men from Lincoln would be at the fair to take care of the horses and to help show them. In addition to stallions, to stalls for the horses, there was a stall to keep equipment and supplies, plus cots and bedding for those who stayed overnight. I remember the first year the draft horse and, and uh, exhibitors were assigned stalls in tents as the barns were reserved for the light horses. The draft horses exhibitors were not happy and in, in several years, that same pattern was followed. In 1918, the folks won a special trophy, which is still, which we still have, and which I'm showing here. 
and we still prize it today. The award was for a stallion and four mares with colts of his breeding, allowed by the, owned by the same person. Since this was World War I times, <coughs> the award had to be something useful, not just an ornament. The award was a set of silverware, six knives and six forks, no spoons, with a horse head imprinted in the handle of each piece. The stallion was Felix. The picture of this horse has been on our wall as long as I can remember, and still is, and I guess will be there as long as I'm in the house. The stallion <coughs> I remember best was a beautiful black pertrin named Double Carnot. I really do not know how the Rotermans got involved in this transaction possibly at one of the fairs where both men were exhibitors. The folks got the stallion on a lease basis from the owner, Mr. W.S. Corsa of Whitehall, Illinois. Mr. Corsa was to receive a certain percent of the coal crop as payment. A seven-year-old mare, Carvette, which was a colt from the Roderman farm, and was raised on the W.S. Corsa estate in Illinois, was grand champion at the New York State Fair in 1936. I recall Mr. Corsa came to Lincoln by train to visit and to check on the stallion and the conditions of the mayors. It was a special event to have such a guest as, such, as a prominent individual and we were just plain country farm kids. Mr. Corsa had one half interest, $20,000, in the stallion car mount, whose price was $40,000. And the horse leased to Rodermans was a son of that $40,000 stallion. And the stallion that we had was listed as double car nut. Mr. Corsa died in 1935 and I still remember what the gentleman looked like. In 1909, the $40,000 stallion car nut was listed as international grand champion stallion. This horse was the father of the stallion that we had. Before Rotermans had car nut, they had several other stallions, but that were sons of international grand champions. But after they had double Carnot, they never changed another stallion. They always remained with the Carnot bloodline. If at folding time, my father, Uncle Henry, or my brother slept in the barn to make sure mare and colt were all okay. Actually, there was an old bed frame on the hayloft with a corn chuck mattress and a feather bed and a cover if needed. It was a special occasion when it came time <clears throat> to fill out registration papers for the new coal crop and to select a suitable name for such. Since the sire was double carnot, a name was to begin with the letters C-A-R. So the Billy Colt of our mayor, Marvette, was named Carvetta. And that's the, the mayor that, that made that showing in Chicago. If a male colt, it was named Carvette. Armaline was named Carmeline. And we had a mayor named Flora, and, and her coat was Carlora. I do not remember the actual number of horses we had, but counting stallions, mares, colts, and yearlings, we had possibly 25 to 30 head. In fact, I have a picture where at least 13 head of grown horses are feeding at a straw stack. 
when the time came to deliver a horse that had been sold, we called on the Ernest Fisher farm, who was a local trucker for many years. The horse was loaded in the open stock truck, not the enclosed trailers used now, and the family gathered around for the event. I still have a vivid picture in mind of the truck leaving the farm, and as it headed down the hill, the horse held his head over the stock truck and nickered as if to bid goodbye to horse and people. I recall my father talking at the time during the night there was a commotion in the barn lot and someone, if a prank or for spite, had turned two stallions loose in the barn lot. The men were able to separate the horses and get each back in his stall. Apparently, there were no broken bones or torn horse flesh. I remember another time my father came in to report three very sick mares. As was the custom, when day's work ended, the horses were watered and fed, and after supper, they were turned out to pasture. When three sick mares appeared, the veterinarian was called in, and he pronounced they had been poisoned. How, when, and where was a mystery, as there had been no change in their feed or water. Sometime later, my uncle was working in that pasture and noticed that across the fence on the railroad right of way was a barrel labored weed killer. Apparently, some of that liquid had drained out and had run onto the grass in the pasture, causing little poisoning. Mystery solved was the conclusion, but also three dead mares. In early days at, at fairs, horses were used for carnival activities. On occasion, my father would borrow harnesses from them if needed to show a team of horses. Or, if a wagon was needed, they would borrow one from farm equipment firms who were happy to have their equipment advertised in that manner. I recall many times when the stallions were led to water at the stock tank. It was a pleasure to watch the horses as they were given their exercise. The horse was given full length of a rope 20 to 25 feet long and circulated around and around the person holding the rope and the, lap and the halter. The first three of my high school years in Lincoln had no school buses, so we were loaded in, in a truck as we went to various small towns to participate in contests. Mr. Fisher, of course, had a big truck, and that truck was cleaned up, and nice thick layer of clean straw covered the floor. I don't remember if any benches or seats were available. I, but I know they were, some of the kids brought blankets or, or quilts to throw on the floor. The vehicle was an open livestock truck with perhaps a tarp cover. We didn't have time on the farm to be bored. For a number of years, there was the 4th of July picnic in our timber with various stands and, of course, the merry-go-round. Now, that's the end of my written speech. But then I got to thinking about never got bored on the farm. During the summertime, there were at least three weeks of thrashing Dad and, uh, and Uncle Henry owned a steam engine and a separator, and they toured their area to do threshing. And I remember one year, and I don't remember the date, but they had finished thrashing at a farm and were moving to the next neighbor, and it's hot summer weather. Dad said, boys, we've got to quit. It's 118 degrees, and your power was your steam engine fired with wood 
so you know driving that steam engine, it was hotter than 118. Then, of course, in the fall was the week of molasses making. But prior to cooking molasses, uh, there was stripping the cane, and you had a little piece of wood, sort of hatchet shaped, with notches in it, and you went to the field with the leaves off each stem. Because so then, of course, then you cut the stems, cut the stalks, brought them to the back to the farm, and ran that through a mill, pressed out the juice, and then you cooked molasses. And the folks had two pans, not well, about half as big as this table. And if you had two pans in each pan, that was a day's cooking. So you know it took several hours to cook one pan of molasses. And you had to watch it carefully. And Kate was there regularly. She would be moving that juice across the bottom of the pan. And, and you fired it with your wood under it to, for the heat. And if it got too hot, pour on the water, it's getting too hot. So they had a barrel of water standing there. And then you cool it down, pouring water on it. And then when your molasses was done, uh, we sold many a gallon at $50, 50 cents a gallon, a gallon. Now, when you buy molasses, it's three dollars and something a quart. And then you had green juice. And then, of course, in the fall, instead of like they did uh, shuck corn in Iowa, we did ours the old-fashioned way. You'd shuck it by hand. And then you'd cut the stalks and run them through the shredder. And then that shredder would separate your ears, would go into a, down a spout in, into a wagon and the shredded corn would be forced up into the barn loft by elevator. That was horse feed. And then in the winter time, there was still another job. The men had a sawmill, sawed lumber. People would haul in logs and indicate they wanted two by four, or four by eight, or one by two, or whatever. And in the winter time, that's how they spent their spent their days. What I, what I would like to ask, uh -huh. you know, horses get old. Your 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 big valuable mm -hmm. stallion. What finally did he die on the he place? Died, I asked Dave Dan that I didn't remember, but I but I know that he didn't go back to Illinois, but he died there on the farm. So they were in St. Louis to begin with, right? They could, uh -huh. What prompted them to move to Benton County? I really don't know. And were they farming in St. Louis? Or they living the in farm. the city? They owned a farm there, south of St. Louis in Je Jefferson County. Uh -huh. hmm. uh, now, whether or not they actually farmed, I don't know whether they brought animals with them uh, on the boat or whether they bought some horses there. I, that I don't know. But Did they have money when they showed up? Were they relatively... Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I often wondered when Great Grandpa got $2,000 yeah. for that stallion. Yeah. Well, I said, that's more money than the rodermans ever had. <laughs> but I'm still amazed. 50 cents an acre for the first 40. Now, which 40 that is, I don't know where that's where the home place is, I don't know. When did these 4th of July celebrations start taking place? Well, I really don't know how it started, but it was a nice shady place, and the folks had opened up the pasture, and they had places to put their horses, and, and that would have been, well, I can barely remember it. It would probably have been in the 30s. The thing I remember about the merry-go-round of course, that was always that was big stuff when we way back when we were kids. But I can remember after the picnic was over and everything was gone and cleared. Of course, Aunt Ella loved flowers, and she would go wherever she could find some good dirt to fill her flower pots. And she would find some cash where the uh, merry-go-round had been. And I guess somebody had dropped their change there. And of course, that was back when times were hard. And, oh God if we could just find some money someplace. We just thought that was wonderful, and Aunt Coletta 
Clara was just up there digging in the dirt and found some money. <laughs> Did you feel poor growing up, or did you feel like you had enough to live on? Or? We had. We never went hungry. You did. You had hand-me-down clothes, and we had a cousin who was a little older than we were, and she was working in Kansas City in St. Louis. She handed down clothes. Everybody was on the same level. You didn't feel like you were being abused or hurt. No. Well, when I was in high school, you had two dresses to wear to work. You wore one dress two days, mm -hmm. and you wore the other one three days, and then Saturday or Sunday you washed it out and went again the next week. And you didn't feel like you were poor folks. Everybody else was in the same circumstance. And of course we had garden, big garden, so we never went, never suffered for food. And of course, well I forgot to mention the butchering. When you butchered, of course, we never butchered beef in our kid days. It was always pork. Butchered five hogs at a time. You know, you had a regular little smokehouse, just a little building with a stove in it. And you smoked your sausage and smoked some of your hams. And some of it you canned. And you made sausage and smoked that. See, there was Aunt Carrie and Uncle Bill. And Ed and Uncle Barney. And Grandma, Uncle Henry, and Aunt Clara. And it was always a thrill to eat supper at Grandma's house. Well, it was a little different. She cooked a little different than Mom did. And sometimes she had the little extra food because, see, Aunt Clara worked in the post office. And she had some money. And you'd have a little different food. What did Uncle Henry do? Worked on the farm. Okay. He was a machine repairman. Of course, on the farm, you always got something broke down. Yeah. <laughs> So you know, he was in, and he farmed, and part of the time he did some carpenter work. See, Uncle Barney was a carpenter, and he and Uncle Barney worked some. And see, he helped Uncle Barney some with carpentry. Uh, over at the shop, the workshop over across the road from my, our mm -hmm. house, uh, there was a place where they uh, shaped the horseshoes. You had to shape the horseshoe to fit the horse each horse's foot. You heat up the forge, heat up the heat up the, the uh, horseshoe, and then on the forge and heavy hammer, sledgehammer, you'd shape that shoe to fit each horse. Did you ever get attached to the horses, like when they were delivered then to the buyer? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then the horse nickered. I can still hear that. <laughs> <laughs>